Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Drew Galloway, and we are here for your weekly recruiting update. Football uh, still going strong throughout spring and getting uh, a lot of attention uh, from recruits because, hey, this is this is kind of a big year for K-State in the recruiting space just because they, they've been building all this equity over the last few years of the staff and gotten to a point where they're finding the right balance of I liken it back to what Bruce Weber said after K-State made that Elite Eight run, where I think this staff is better than Bruce did, found the right balance of the kind of guys that you build a program like K-State off of, but also taking your swings for some of those guys that you normally wouldn't be able to get in the living room of before. Now, it also certainly helps that there are some things working to K-State's advantage in those situations this time around. You have a lot of them in the state of Kansas in the 2025 recruiting class, which is a big deal. Uh, you have some notable guys from just outside of the state, whether it be Missouri or Oklahoma, that there's proximity. And K-State has done a good job of establishing relationships in both of those states, uh, and Oklahoma being one of the new hotter ones because of Matt Wells and what he's been able to do. So there's a lot of that to be taken into consideration with what K-State's doing right now and how it sets up moving forward. And one of the guys that probably, is it fair to say number one on, on the list right now of who they're working the hardest for or want to make sure they get locked down is Lincoln Cure, uh, one of the top 50 players in the country that just so happens to be from Goodland. And uh, he's going to be in town very soon. Yeah, he'll be on campus uh, tomorrow, actually, uh, Thursday, April 11th, as we're recording this. So it's it's a big deal because he hasn't been on campus for a little bit, but he also hasn't taken a lot of visits just in general because he's just a busy guy uh, playing basketball. Now it's track season. So he's had a lot to do and kind of he's starting to narrow down his recruitment a little bit. I think that you're starting to see that from what a lot of sites are putting out there. Like I would agree with it as well, that I still think that K-State is a first play in first place by a, pro, a pretty good margin. And then Oregon, probably second, Texas A&M, third. But I, I think that K-State is still the runaway leader. And we're still kind of in a wait and see on when he ends up committing. Because I, I know that that's a big domino and a big chip out there. And people will say, well, the longer that it goes, I think that people think, well, it could be a bad thing. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that the longer it goes, that it no news is just good news. And there hasn't been a lot of news, and that's been good for K-State because it means that nobody has really caught up. And if you're on this really how to expedite the process, it could actually be another Kansas native that expedites the process a little bit uh, because if Desan Braham ends up committing to Oregon, who made his final six and K-State did not, that I think that it probably leads to the domino of, okay, Cure's just off the board now because I just don't see him at Texas A&M with how, how far out in front even Oregon is of Texas A&M. Well, so real quick before we, we continue talking about kind of the Lincoln Cure situation, you mentioned Hassan Brame, K-State doesn't even make the, the final six. I think most had come to the conclusion and understanding through a lot of the things that you've hinted at and basically, he wasn't going to end up at K-State. It didn't seem like that's where things were going. Certainly seems like the kind of guy that, you know, the proximity, he would like to be further from home and maybe expand out. And, like, when you have programs like Oregon or Tennessee or whoever calling, like that, you're going to want to be interested in those. Uh, but were you surprised that K-State didn't even get mentioned in the in the top six there at the end? In a way, yes, but – kind of how DY laid it out that it's probably better for both sides that Casey didn't make the final six, because I think that from k State's perspective, they didn't want to be kind of strung along knowing that they probably weren't going to end up landing him. And I think that it, it shows kind of a sign of maturity for Brame to kind of tell them already that, okay, like as much and as hard as you guys have been recruiting me and like, both of my parents went to K-State. Like, I want to kind of build my own path and go somewhere. Because, I mean, you you could say here right now that I, I think that Oregon is still pretty out in front for him. And you can make the argument that he's kind of 
doing K-State a favor in that sense because I think that Oregon's just so far out in front that even like a school like Oklahoma where uh, his dad and actually played with Brent Venables, that you could say that he's kind of doing the opposite to Oklahoma if Oklahoma was not to get him. Yeah, that's. A, I guess that's a, a good point. There's not even the the carrot being dangled there to you know, really essentially. It's not like I don't think K State would just fully, you know, shut down anything there. I don't think that's really in their mo. You want to keep a good relationship, especially with the way that uh, college football and really just collegiate recruiting works in general these days. But it is one of those deals where okay, we know that we're mostly out there we can put our full attention here. We don't have to divert resources as much to this anymore. And ultimately there's the other side of it too, where Lincoln cure, you talked about Oregon being one of those others that would be kind of in the mix for Lincoln cure. It also does K state a solid. If Desan Brame ends up being the four star tight end that Oregon gets, because not, not many schools are going to just think that they need to go, I think all the way in on the tight end thing. So there's an added benefit of that as well, where, uh, it, it probably was unfortunate for some K-State people to see, but ultimately I, I don't think it's anything to overreact about, uh, but maybe just some were a little surprised that they didn't even, I, I wouldn't call it like a pity ad, but just the, <laughs> hey, you know, they're, I, they have ties there, all this, let me throw them in there, but I'm not going there. So ultimately probably a better thing for K-State to not uh, be included on that list. Now in terms, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I also understand like where Bram is coming from because, having two tight ends in the top 100 in the same yeah. state and, and, and knowing how that case state is so far in front for cure, I could see where that would deter me personally from going to case state as well. Yeah. And I, you know, I've always tried to paint this picture to people on the recruiting thing. S some kids are totally cool and they have the drive and the want to stay close to home but there are a lot of others that they view it the opposite way and it's their opportunity to get further away. And there's, you know, everybody's different on what that, that distance is that makes them comfortable being away from home where I I've said it before, like to me, I thought two hours was the perfect amount of time away from home where it was like, if I needed to go back in one day, I could, but I did not see my parents every weekend or, you know, every, like it wasn't, so, but in totally different, I wasn't playing college football, but I think that's what people need to understand. Cause then, you know, I knew people that they were comfortable with, you know, staying close to home and what I just couldn't have done it. Like I, you know, whatever I, I had, number one, I had zero interest in going to Hutchinson community college, but number two, like that would, that would not have felt like college to be in the same areas where I grew up. So I think it's one of those deals and some kids want to get out and, and do something bigger and different and others, they get the allure of being kind of the in-state kid, the hometown hero, if you will. And that drives them. I mean, we're seeing that with Avery Johnson right now. Yes. Um, but there are a lot of Avery Johnsons out there that aren't from the state of Kansas that you can pick whatever random state it is. And they may have a great option in whatever state they're in, but they look at it and say, hey, you know what? I, I want to go somewhere different. Like it happens. Uh, and, and people, I think, have to understand that. So. Lincoln Cure uh, seems to be K-State's target there and, and good to see that you think that they're still leading. Now, in terms of what else is going to go on as he visits this week, what what are some of the expectations on how this recruitment continues to play out and what K-State can do, I guess, to maybe continue to push him towards pulling the trigger on committing? Uh, I would expect that this will probably drag out to the summer. I just I, I don't see him being in a big-time rush and. And to be honest, like, I, I don't necessarily blame him. Like, it, it's a once in a lifetime thing, hopefully, for, for most kids to kind of go through this process. And, and I just, I don't see him being in a big time rush. The only time that I really thought that it was going to happen soon was when they took that uh, trip, the entire offensive staff plus Taylor Brout went to Goodland to his school. That was the only time that I really felt like, okay, maybe it happens now. But, I mean, never say never. It could end up happening. I, I just think that KC just needs to do what they do and just show him everything and that he grew up a K-State fan and went to games as a kid. So just kind of play into that and, and you just see what happens because, I mean, you, you never know. And, and that's why picking, like, a, a timeline of when guys are going to commit 
because sometimes they'll tell you, hey, I don't really feel like I'm going to commit until like the summer and this will be in like January. And then like three days later, they commit <laughs> so, like you you genuinely never know sometimes. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. Anybody that has has followed this for uh, any ex extended period of time will know that information one day in recruiting can be totally different the next and it's not it's not even the important stuff but it's something like the commitment date where it's like yeah you know it's going to come later and then uh you know we, it's like we get a cat signal like, okay it's not this guy like i know it's not oh no it is him okay whatever or some of those guys will just be straight up with you like two days in advance and be like yeah i'm committing on monday like uh -huh. it just it's a wild thing i have i have a funny story about like the timing thing like I, there was one player in the 2023 class where he told me a time that he was going to commit so i did all of my stuff to just kind of get ready for it whatever and then uh, i ended up going to my sister's house and just kind of wanted to sit by the pool and relax and because i knew that the commitment wasn't supposed to happen to like five o'clock it's like noon and the cat signal goes out and he committed by like 12 30. It's like you you genuinely never know with the timing because things change so fast. Yeah, no, it's it's fun. I mean, I remember last year there was one where uh, Alec <laughs> sent, sent a text like, yeah, I think they're going to get this guy. And I was like, oh, what makes you think that? And then he responded <laughs> and said, well, actually, he just told me that he's committing tomorrow. So <laughs> I was like, OK, all right, there you go. There there we have it. I understand why you feel good about it now. Uh, in addition to Lincoln Cure, what else is new on the recruiting trail? I know that there was a, a handful of offers that have gone out to some guys even closer to home for K-State. Uh, so what's kind of the book on on those new offerees? Uh, so one of the new offerees is uh, Keaton Jones from Coffeyville. No relation to Daryl Jones uh, at K-State, which very strange because, you know, same high school even in Coffeyville. Same last name. No relation. Do you want to you want a fun fact about Field Kinley High School? Yeah. I like the fun facts. All right, what you got? Uh, they they played in the 2013 4A state championship game. You know who they lost to? Uh, did they lose to Bueller? They lost to the Bueller Crusaders. <laughs> so uh, shout out to the Crusaders there. <laughs> um, so K State has kind of had him on the radar for a little bit. Hadn't offered up until uh, this past visit. But actually, the one of the reasons that I think that K State has kind of ended up pulling the trigger is that I think it's because they're fading away a little bit with Andrew Babalola. I just, with all the big time schools going after him, I just think that that's kind of gotten away from K-State a little bit. And uh, the the recruitment of Broderick Scholl has kind of gotten away from K-State a little bit. I think that Auburn probably leads for Broderick Scholl. So now it's, okay, we've had you on our radar for a little bit. We just offered. So what what's next? K-State needs to play a little bit of catch up, but I think that it's still doable. I think it's a Texas Tech, Auburn, and Arkansas right now are probably the top schools for uh, Keaton Jones. And I mean, th those aren't like unbeatable schools for K-State to, to end up uh, catching up and securing Keaton Jones if they want. So like, yeah, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, Charlie Wolben from DeSoto, another uh, recent offeree, a defensive end. Another one that K-State's probably playing a little bit of catch-up for because uh, Iowa State and Minnesota also have official visits already scheduled for uh, Charlie Wolben. So that's one to kind of keep in mind, two new local uh, targets that K-State's going after. And it's kind of just wait-and-see mode because they've already had them on campus. Now it's, okay, can we get them back? Yeah, it's it, it, interesting to bring those guys up because I, I would point out to people that you think, oh, man, why is K-State lagging behind here? This is not going to be good. K-State has won these types of catch-up battles before or at least made it a dead heat after maybe sliding behind. Do you have any any good examples of circumstances like that that might give some people some hope that, hey, this isn't the worst thing in the world that K-State – maybe lagged and now they're they're jumping out because now they either see a need or they think okay these guys have met the criteria of what we want in a recruit that deserves an offer uh the kind of a recent example they weren't late necessarily but wesley fair was i think k-state was like the second or third offer and, and k-state got him committed within like two or three months of going after him um you could even say that while again it was still 
pretty early on in his process, but K State was like the fourth or fifth school to offer Avery Johnson and pulled ahead. Uh, but th this late, it, it's not like a huge deal to do it this late, even because K State still has time to get guys back on campus. And, and I just think that they're in a good enough spot because they'd been recruiting these guys already. It's just that the offer is very recent. Uh, another one that really just kind of came to my mind right now was uh, Colin Dunn, where Casey had offered him and then cooled and then went back and put the pressure on him and heated up and then took an official visit and then he committed. So, I mean, it, it's very possible. And it's recruitment 101 is to keep guys engaged, even if you haven't offered yet and get guys on campus, even if you haven't offered yet, because when you offer, that's really when you start to turn up the heat. And K-State doesn't like putting out uncommittable offers to in-state products. So I think that it's all kind of like a perfect storm of, okay, now we're really going after these two now. Yeah, I think I, good to give people kind of that insight and that uh, understanding that this isn't going to be the worst thing in the world for K-State, and they can overcome this. Uh, now, real quick, did, off the top of your head, you know which schools were were beating K State to the offer for Avery Johnson. Uh, Iowa State, I think, and TCU for the first two. A after that, it's pretty fuzzy, though. Okay, well that though that's good enough. People at least now know. Hey, Iowa State, take that, uh, <laughs> getting one over on the clones for everybody. Uh, all right, so that's kind of where recruiting is. You you said it earlier today when we were talking that. Uh, not like the most action recruiting wise at this point in time in terms of differences between when we talked last week to today, which of course will happen because uh, we were a little behind last week and we didn't talk about it until Friday. So it's only been like five days in between, uh, but certainly we'll have more on it next week to kind of get into. Now, before we go, we'll shift gears to basketball real quick because another really interesting name entered the transfer portal that K-State could possibly see themselves in on a guy that spent time locally that you're going to want to probably take a look at. Obviously, uh, significant athleticism there and started 67 games over his first two seasons of college basketball. Duke's Mark Mitchell is going to be in the transfer portal. Averaged almost 12 points a game this year, six boards a game, made over half of his shots from the field. Not the craziest of shooters. Um, only takes a little over one three a game, and it's mixed results. Year one, it was 35%. This year, it was 27 Free throw shooting uh, was is in like the 60s for his career. So he's not some great shooter, but there's a ton of athleticism there and was a really highly thought of recruit that was fine at Duke, but just not of the caliber that probably was going to lend them to saying, hey, your spot is safe because, you know, two years under John Shire, they want to be better than what they've been. So what do you think of uh, the poten potential fit that Mark Mitchell could have if K-State gets in on this? I, I think that his ceiling is sky high, and that's probably worth taking a look at if you're K-State. But I, I just have questions of where he fits. And, I mean, we talked about this before recording, that to me he's he's a better or at least on par with David Gasson in terms of being able to shoot the ball. So I, I just don't know how he would fit together with him, Gasson, and even uh, Michael Brown Jones, who Casey had made the top three of. Like if you get all three of those guys, I, I just don't know how they necessarily fit together because even Brown Jones shot, I think it was forty three percent, but it's not like he was shooting a ton of threes this year either. So it's for me, it's like a, a wait and see. I, I would pursue Brown Jones more and try and get him locked up. And then like, if you still have a roster spot open and Mark Mitchell wants to come to K-State, that's when I would really turn up the heat. But I, I don't think that I, if I was K-State, I would necessarily be all in on Mark Mitchell right now. And the, just because with football, you know, I'm thinking in terms of how football operates, you can kind of go and just, hey, this guy's got talent. He's got athleticism. Let's put him on here. I don't know, like basketball scholarships are a little bit more limited, but I think K-State's going to have enough in this process to where it's worth giving it a go here if that opportunity presents itself because 
there is a lot of potential still, I think. And yeah, you can try and find a fit and say, well, if Gasson's going to come back, like, how is this going to ultimately though, like still slightly different players, actually more, it's more than slight. I would say Mark Mitchell's skill set lends himself to being able to create a little bit more for himself. And we talked about this too. And, and kind of my counterpoint to you, like, yeah, Mark Mitchell, not like an overwhelming shooter. Um, and that's why a, a guy like Michael Brown Jones, like I would, I want him number one, if we're talking about what K state's hunt is in the portal and we're trying to prioritize guys here. Cause again, not a high volume, but over two shots a game shot it well from three. We saw with K state, the way they played last year, they need floor spacers at other positions on the floor and guys that can knock down shots. And that's the one area that I would give, uh, Mark Mitchell a little bit of a boost on ahead of David Gasson is that yes, while not overly pretty, at least he takes those shots. And there were so many times last year where you look at David Gasson and you say, man, if you could just shoot a lick and you would take that shot and guys would have to even think about it, that would be helpful. Like Gasson shot 18 threes last year. He was three of 18 under 17%. That's why you look at a guy like Mitchell. Yeah, numbers not overwhelming, but he was 28% this season. That would make a world of difference. I mean, I, I really, this is probably an overstatement, but I do kind of believe that if you had a guy like Mark Mitchell, not even just the other stuff, but if we're saying that you take what he did shooting the basketball this past season uh, and you, you gave those numbers to David Gasson, obviously you'd need a healthy one, and teams had at least respected a little bit more, I think that's one of those things that it makes K-State a win or two better just because the offense has better flow to it. So I would be very interested in K-State exploring this and seeing where things go, and uh, we'll see how over the next couple of days things start to kind of shake down and, and what the word ends up being where K-State goes in the portal because uh, tomorrow's going to be the uh, the end of the dead period. So. Mitchell is also like a very, very good athlete. Like, and his ceiling is super high. Like I said, like, it's just for me, it's like, uh, I would have him on the list, just not at the top. I don't think, but I, I, I do think that there's a lot of things that he can really provide because I, I think that with his athleticism, he has the potential to be a very, very good defender. Yeah. Uh, a lot of good big options out there right now for K state. If you're you're looking in the portal and trying to figure out, uh, D.Y. and I talked about yesterday, Omar Ballo went in from Arizona, number two player in the transfer portal right now. And uh, that's one that we'll see if K-State tries to get in the mix. And then Clifford Amore is one that a lot of teams are all over. Uh, good shot blocking potential there. Uh, the transfer from Rutgers, also a top 10 type of guy. And then we obviously uh, have just talked about some of the other opportunities that are out there right now for for k-state and that's why you know we talked about terrace reed early on in the process but that's a name that's kind of slid the back burner right now because there are a lot of other names now in the mix for k-state as they uh try to fill at least three more scholarships but depending on what arthur kaluma ends up deciding there may be another one that's available there and if anything else comes about so a lot of different things for k-state to work through and uh, that's the latest there on the basketball side of things Tomorrow, we will have more on football. DUI will be back. We'll go over some of the things that Matt Wells said in his press conference on Wednesday as the co-OC and quarterbacks coach met with the media for uh, his, his go-around this spring. We heard from Joe Klanderman last week, so if you didn't get the breakdown of that, you can go back and watch it as well. And the full Matt Wells press conference up already today, so you can go see that here at K-State Online and get yourself prepared for tomorrow. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching this edition of the KSO Show. Be sure to head over to kstateonline.com and uh, check out everything going on with basketball transfer portal, football recruiting, spring ball notes from DY, and also uh, if you want to start melting down again like some probably are in their head about the Jerome Tang situation, even though right now no reason to melt down. Don't, don't pre-panic or freak out. Like Just see where the wind blows. Take it easy, folks. Uh, that's my advice for uh, this Wednesday. We'll see what comes tomorrow, though. A lot can change in 24 hours. That's the uh, lesson that, that Drew has taught us with recruiting today. So <laughs> that will do it for us. We're out of here. We'll see you again tomorrow.